by the French Revolution. That can said, in the storm and fire of these powerful events, organized and fighting women raised the demand for the complete equality of the female sex in the family, society, and state. Feminism, after centuries of existence as an idea, a complaint, now takes the stage of history as a social political force because all of society has been brought under question mark, not simply by words, but by deeds. Some principled spokespersons for women's equality and loosely connected women's groups developed during that time. In France and Germany, some of the pioneers demanded not only the emancipation of both of women, but also an improvement in the living conditions of women workers. But this, but this did not happen as a result of the proletarian class view, but rather in the name of sentimental humanity, which wanted to help the poor sisters from above and did not want to call them to a struggle for themselves from below. The appearance of the workers as a united militant class in the revolutions in France and Germany intensified the class contradictions. The proletariat began to become a unionized and political organized revolutionary force and the bourgeoisie became a reactionary and counter -re uh, revolutionary class. And the Bourgeois women's movement took an active part in this development. They became more moderate and rational, putting bourgeois class interests above the equality of the female sex. And on the other hand, after the Commune in Paris, many socialists realized that working women could and should be one for the socialist cause. Um, and the rise of the women's movement in the late 18th and 19th century was no accident. So, uh, second. Oh. <laughs> ah, this was the first. <laughs> then uh, the second. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like here you see Clara Zeck. <laughs> and she pointed out, I just, uh, because it's a long uh, quote. So, Capitalism created the economic basis of and was the main driving force behind the endeavor towards complete social equality of men and women. The capitalist mode of production, which was the foundation of bourgeois society, destroyed the social conditions of domestic productive activity by women and children. The development of modern cities deprived them of their working place in the family as well as of their source of agricultural raw materials. The progressive industrialization in the 19th century and the eruption of the traditional family structures forced more and more working class women to enter the industrial workforce, especially because the income of most working class men was not enough um, yeah, to survive. The new role of women causes the economic independence from men and was the source for challenging the political and social supremacy of men. But, but in a capitalist society, women went from house slaves to become work slaves for the capitalists, so they needed to fight both. Here are some pictures from different workplaces. Uh, yeah, in the, yeah, late 19th century, uh, beginning of the um, 20th century. And at this time, 6 million women were working in Germany, more than one quarter of the women's population. And 5 million of them in factories. And in England and Wales, for example, there were 4 million working women. Yeah. <laughs> and so on. <laughs> all over Europe and the US women entering the workforce. This led to the contradictory situation that on the one hand, working class women had to deal with a double burden. They, so they had to work and still had to do all the care work, housework in the family, etc. But on the other hand, being part of the working class created the basis for potentially get organized and fight for women's liberation and for liberation in general. 
And in Germany, by 1913, 230,000 were organized in trade unions. The Social Democrats, SPD, had uh, 175,000 women members out of a total membership of a million. Yeah, this rapid growth of the women's movement is to be seen, of course, within the context of the growth of the SPD and the working class movement in general. And women in Russia, for example, played also a key role in the Russian Revolution. Female workers were at the forefront of campaigns against the First World War, against price rises and appalling working conditions. So first, I want to um, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the situation in Germany and then also got into some more details about the Russian Revolution and the women um, and the role of women there. Uh, I think it's uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and 1889, at the founding Congress of the Sec Second International held in Paris, Clara Zetkin, which was also one of the organizers, spoke on the role of women in the revolutionary struggle for socialism, stressing, stressing the need for a program for the proletarian women's movement. Um, it was a result of her intervention that the Second International set the pace for socialists of various countries to draw women into the struggle for revolutionary socialism. And as a response, okay. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. okay, it just needs time. <laughs> and as, um, as a response to this, the effort program of the Social Democratic Party of 1891 demanded full economic, political, and legal equality for women. The SPD was the first party to adopt a full pro-feminist position. And during that time, it was also a fight against the right-wing workers' movement who saw women as the weakest section of the working class who undermined the wages of better organized men and this had an influence on working class men in general. <laughs> okay. And uh, it was important, it was an important step to organize working class women um, uh, by publishing the magazine Gleichheit. You see here in the uh, on the slide, yeah, it was um introduced in 1891 and uh, Clara Zetkin became editor of this magazine Gleichheit. It's uh, equality in German. This magazine um, uh, was in the following years grows into a broad movement organizing national congresses and even international congresses. And this all in the context that it was actually still being illegal until 1907 for women to be politically active. Um, and Gleichheit, but Gleichheit was seen as a central organizer of the women's work. And Gleichheit didn't get financial support from the party organization until 1903. And this shows that it was still a fight within also in the SPD to convince comrades about the importance of organizing, educate, agitate, agitate women workers. And now, uh, yeah, what, what was also very dip, uh, important was the development of a program around women's liberation. And uh, Setkin's speech at the Party Congress of the Social Democratic Party in Gotha, 1896, was the basis for a program around uh, this. From the very beginning, she fought for theoretical clarity. And on the basis of Engels and Bebel's, uh, she analyzes that in a capitalist society, total women's liberation is not possible and a unified working class movement for socialism is necessary. But therefore, a broad program that actually reflects the reality for working class women and the double burden they are under as women and part of the working class is needed. This obviously uh, comes along with the analysis that working class women have no common cause with the bourgeois feminist movement, which was also growing during that time. I, need, I think I need to have to shorten a little bit for that. Um, okay. 
Um, yeah, and the first attempt of Zetkin and Gleichheit was to fully, uh, fully integrate women into the party, but they find out that women are not heard and repre represented. Mm -hmm. women, uh, Zetkin concluded women have to organize separately, not just because legal reasons, but also because of backward attitudes of male comrades. Um, because of the strong patriarchal influences in the working class. In, nine, in 1908, uh, they, the, they established a women's bureau, which was subordinate to the National Party Executive Board. And uh, they also built a political education network for socialist women. And by 1908, they had clubs in over 150 different towns and cities and 4,000 women met on a weekly basis. And here you see also Clara Zetkin, yeah, like uh, agitating uh, women in these <laughs> clubs. And the socialist women's movement first mainly focuses on active interventions and support of strikes of female workers. But then uh, from the late 90s onwards, they are moving to a broader appreciation of women's oppression, highlighting um, it through campaigns and on issues uh, such as sexual harassment and work, civil rights, free and quality public childcare, challenging of gender stereotypes and of course put forward the idea for universal suffrage playing a key role in the movement. And I think this is maybe also interesting uh, for today or if we talk about how we should address uh, women or is it, uh, because yeah they move beyond the very traditional view of the working class to reach out for example to laundry workers domestic workers seamstresses and working class housewives um, which were all affected by radicalization and women were also on the left of the working class movement and from the beginning in opposition of the First World War, which is interesting. And I think Katja goes into some more details about this. So maybe I leave it by that. <laughs> so, and especially Gleichheit um, becomes more associated with the left wing of the movement. And therefore the leadership of the party starts attacking the women's movement and especially Zetkin, of course. And a key feature of the socialist women's movement was a strong international approach. The German Marxist women became the main force in the international socialist women's movement, organizationally as well as politically. Um, Kolontai um, and other Russian women leaders were also an important force on the left. Kolontai was forced into exile in 1908 and spent the next nine years in organizing internet in the international socialist movement and socialist uh, feminist movement. In 1907, uh, the first socialist women's international conference was organized um, at which 59 women from 15 different countries participated. And I think it's still interesting to read the material of this conference because it was a real place for real clashes, uh, clashes of ideas, uh, exchange of ideas around program, different tactics, especially about uh, different tactics, uh, tactics around suffrage, uh, the suffrage movement. And uh, these discussions uh, also um, led to discussions around the limitations of formal political equality and women's role at work and in the family. And three years later, the second international conference held at Copenhagen in 1910 adopted the revolution prepared by Clara Zetkin to establish uh, the age of uh, 8th of March as International Women's Day. So in, on the 8th and, and at the 8th of March in 1911, uh, at Le uh, in Berlin alone, uh, one million men and women uh, were marching. I think it's, yes. Yeah, in the years before the war, you see a massive radicalization and increasing activity of working class women, not only in Germany, but also in other countries. Like you see in, the pic in this picture in 1910, Chicago garments workers strike. Um, which were uh, involved like uh, over 40,000 uh, mostly immigrant and female workers. 
Okay, I want to use my last. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, now I want to use my last 10 minutes uh, to talk about the Russian Revolution and uh, the, uh, the Russian Revolution in uh, 905 and in 1917 had a huge impact on the socialist movement and also on the socialist women's movement uh, uh, in the whole world. And historians have uh, ignored the role that women played in the revolution not as wives and lovers, but as militant activists and as political leaders. And yeah, may, I think you know Alec Alexandra Kolontai. Uh, she's the best known of the Bol women Bolsheviks. She was at the heart of the Russian Revolution, but there were also a lot of other leading female party members. Similar to Germany in the beginning of uh, the 20th century, the idea of a Appealing to women was controversial with many socialists and trade unionists in Russia because women were overwhelmingly concentrated and unskilled, poorly organized industries, and therefore appeared to, to lack the capacity of, to organize themselves. They were also considered to be the most politically backward section of the working class, but this changed during the huge strike waves of 1905. Yeah, just to give you one impressive example, I read out the quote, uh, on, uh, it's from this book, <laughs> um, on uh, June the 3rd, 1905, 11,000 women textile workers came out on strike near Moscow in one of the largest strikes ever seen in Russia. Russia. Some 28 women were shot dead and Olga Gan Gankina, a Bolshevik activist, was brutally murdered by, by Black Hundred thugs when she was discovered with a suitcase full of weapons. Her example inspired other women to join the streets fighting groups. Even after the revolution had been defeated in 1907, these textile workers had the confidence to strike to win half day off every week to do the laundry. Mm -hmm. And women politicized by the events of 1905 joined the Bolshevik party as nurses, street fighters, and agitators. And uh, Kollontine campaigned for the recognition of women's demands. By spring 1906, Kollontine and some of her friends had established discussion groups for women workers based on the very limited socialist publications aimed at women. Yeah, I think I like this picture that is <laughs> with uh, Colin Tai and uh, yeah, female activists. Mm, you can go uh, next. <laughs> um, but uh, the situation um, of, for women changed obviously during the war. Men were at the front and women began to replace them in the factories and workplaces. In 1914, around a quarter of industrial workers were women in Russia, and in 1917, it was nearly half. And in the factories, women endured terrible hardships with no legal protection. Women discovered to be pregnant were sacked on the spot. It was a yeah, really horrible situation. And, this, and the situation in the um, factories was combined with the terrible shortages in school and basic food stuff. And uh, working women had to join the queues for bread after the extreme long shifts. And the queues were up to a mile long. So you can imagine uh, how long their day was. And after that care work. <laughs> and then on International Women's Day in 1917, the anger of the women exploded onto the streets of St. Petersburg. At that day, nine. 900,000 workers joined the women on strike. I think you see a picture there. And these women ignited the February revolution and unleashed a huge social movement. But it was not a totally spontaneous leaderless revolution. So like uh, yeah, some historians say, the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg established a women's circle 
um, tasked with organization and propaganda among the female factory workers, linking the anti-war agitation with the economic issues of high prices, inflation, and argued and fought and agitated for socialist politics before that. And as you probably know, from February to October in um, Russia, uh, the provisional government and the Soviets compete for authority. And the provisional government didn't deliver what the working women were demanding, bread and peace. <laughs> Support was shifting away in the direction of the Soviets to the revolutionaries uh, and to the revolutionaries. And I, I need to finish soon, but just to give you one last example. Um, uh, and on 1st May 1917, 4,000 laundresses strike in Petrograd, and they had a 14 hour stay and very low wages. They demanded an eight hour stay and refused the provisional, provisional government's instruction to, to return to work choosing instead to tour the city's laundries is extinguishing the fires used to heat the water. There yeah, you see here like the laundresses during that time in Petrograd. And the, the role of, uh, um, yeah, one of the strike leaders were Bolshevik and also Kolontai um, was there like every day at the picket lines, etc., and were organizing the women. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Bolshevik members organized laundresses unions in their neighborhoods, but also a citywide union. And the Bolshevik paper carried out regular updates, appeals for financial supports, and lists of the names of strike breakers. Okay. And by October 1917, some 30,000 women had joined the Bolsheviks. The revolution intensified the Bolshevik party's long-standing practice in, of involving women in, the, in all its activities. The revolution in October created an extraordinary body of new laws. Um, for example, uh, six weeks after the, the revolution, civil marriage was legalized and divorce was made legal and accessible to all. So homosexuality also was legalized and so on. I think you know also know a lot of um, yeah things they did. <laughs> so we know obviously Soviet. Soviet Russia was uh, left isolated, imperialist armies intent on smashing the new worker state and uh, the Stalinist counter-revolution attacks the gains, but still the Russian working class achieved more through their revolution than women and other societies and countries achieved through years of campaigning and protesting. Hey comrades, I'm Katja from Ireland. I'll take this thing off. My bit is about why are we discussing this today? <laughs> Obviously, um, working class women doing full stuff is a very good reason, but I think there's also some specific points we can make that are relevant for today. I think in general, this period in history from the 1880s to 1910 uh, has some key features that are interesting and re resonate for today. It's a period of time where new sections are being drawn into the working class, you know, a huge increase of women in, uh, working in factories and so on. Large sections of, the, uh, of our class were unorganized. There were virtually no revolu clear revolutionary parties that had significantly deep roots in the working class. The, you know, the second international had a different nature as more of a general working class uh, political organization rather than a clear revolutionary uh, Party. And it's a period of theoretical confusion and huge debates. 
it's the period where reformism, Bernstein first comes to the fore, where the nature of capitalism is actively being discussed within the movement, where there's a lack of an understanding around what imperialism is, and where there's a lack of understanding about the role of a revolutionary party. Now, material conditions made it unavoidable that working class people were being radicalized and were moving into action. You've got a period of radicalization of women in general, first wave feminism around voting rights and so on. And you've got a period of growth of working class struggle. And working class women were impacted by both of those. And in some instances, the incredibly inspiring stories of how those two merged. Well, here I want to focus on the lessons that, that we can learn from the actions of revolutionary socialist women and the struggle that they were involved in in this period. So I've just picked somewhat randomly four points that I think would be really interesting for the discussion. The first one is the understanding of interconnectedness of exploitation and oppression, that both of them for working class women were the reality of capitalism. The second one is organizing the unorganized. I'm breaking into this commission over there now. Um, but the idea of breaking beyond the traditional orientation of male-dominated, increasingly bureaucratized uh, trade unions, for instance, in Germany. <laughs> and the third point is, why was the women's work so important in making sure that socialists took a strong anti-war stance? And I think that is rooted in a correct understanding of imperialism by the, 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 the socialist in, uh, in, in Socialist Women's International. And the last point I'm going to throw out there for discussion is the Bolsheviks' uh, coining of the term agitation of the deed, which meant a specific approach to organizing women workers, which took into account the material conditions facing them, but also how every working class struggle has a specific feature of self-organization and practical solidarity. So back to my first point, understanding of interconnectedness of exploitation and oppression. So Linda has already given so many inspiring examples. I thought I would start with some negative ones. <laughs> because not all sections of the working class movement recognize this point. And actually they paid a very significant price if they ignored it or misunderstood it. There were people like, well, there were socialists like LaSalle. I really don't like LaSalle who saw women workers as backwards, uh, as people who were undermining paying conditions of male workers, and basically refused to organize working, working women. But not only did they not organize women workers, they also refused to recognize the double oppression that women face and develop a program to address issues that impacted women workers specifically. So also, for instance, didn't support uh, universal suffrage. <laughs> And obviously, with that approach, cut themselves off from the, the developing radicalization around first aid feminism. I'm just going to summarize the consequence of that with two figures. German socialists by 1913 organized over 175,000 female workers, 20% of the membership of the, the SPD. The French Socialist Party by 1913 had 800 women members, less than 1% of their members. They paid a price for their mistake. But furthermore, a lack of engagement by socialists on those issues of orientating towards women, working class women, it left space for bourgeois feminists to orientate towards working class women and effectively lead, lead them astray. There's unfortunately many examples of that, France, Belgium, and so on. But Kolontai, in her uh, history of the women workers movement in Russia, gives a very good example. Where she describes before 1905 how bourgeois women actually or started to organize working class women into yellow trade unions, effectively, and women only unions, and, and, and started to break class solidarity through those uh, uh, type of initiatives. I think that's probably enough negativity, is it? I'll go back to positive. Um, <laughs> because where socialist women started to organize, they were able to build really significant roots and impressive organizations with high levels of engagement. Uh, and I think Linda has already given examples of Germany, uh, of Kolontai, the Bolshevik women after 1905. 
And that organization had a key impact on the period from 1914 to 1917 and the revolutionary struggles that broke out right across uh, Europe and the world in, uh, after 19, from 1917 on. And a key aspect of how they were able to build those significant organizations is because they had a program that didn't draw artificial distinctions between women workers and working class women. The idea that when you're in work, you're one person and then the minute you go home, you're a different person. <laughs> They integrated demands around issues of oppression and exploitation from low pay, precarious conditions, economic independence, maternity leave, childcare, canteens, sexual harassment, but also sexual liberation, the need for divorce, abortion, and so on. And that expressed itself also organizationally. So they used the fact that they organized during the war, for instance, that they had organized women workers and had an impact with them and realized that those women were also soldiers' wives. So they organized unions of so soldiers' wives and asked those soldiers' wives to then intervene with the soldiers. And then these were the, the first Bolsheviks who intervened with soldiers and actually built really strong, no, but eventually became a very strong intervention uh, with soldiers, was based on that work. On to my second point, organizing the unorganized. The example that Linda gave at the very end is actually an excellent example of it. But like the, the approach that Gleichheit took from the very start when it started uh, being published was to look at the working class as a whole and look at also the unorganized section, the laundre laundresses, the domestic workers and so on. And you see it in the pub publications that they published that they consciously reached out to those workers, highlighted their struggles and really, you know, brought them out as an integral part of working class struggle. And you also see how they constantly want to make a point within the movement itself about the importance of organizing the unorganized. For instance, at the end of this uh, strike of 4,000 laundresses in, uh, in, in Petrograd, Kolontai writes an article. And the key point she makes in that article is, this now proves that women are no longer the backward and uh, unaware sector of the class. Mm -hmm. And you see in the 25 years of, 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 of this work developing and, and organizing and so on, that they, um, they don't dumb down their program. They fight actively against any attempt to dumb down programs. You know, there was still that section of, the, of, of, of socialists that thought you needed knitting um, patterns and, and cooking uh, recipes to organize women. You know? They do the opposite, right? They see this magazine as not just an organizer of women, but as a, an organizer to, to create cater to fight for women cadres to be developed. So there's no dumbing down of the program, but there is an enriching of the program by all these different experiences of new sections of the class that become active, that bring their own issues into it, like sexual harassment of domestic workers who are obviously you know, in extremely vulnerable positions, for instance. So what you have is programmatic clarity, but incredible flexibility organization. Strong focus on self-organization, often outside of the uh, official structures in the first place, and then go into the official structures to fight for, for, for their space. Not just a workplace focus, but also a neighborhood focus, because it was easier to organize women often in, in, the, in, in their neighborhoods. And just a lot of practical consideration about what it would mean for women to be active and how, how they could be facilitated to become active. <laughs> on to my third point which is why uh, of all the organizations within the Second International was the women's work so strong in their anti-war stance. Well, uh, Com is obviously aware of the background here of year after year after year, the Second International coming out with uh, anti-war resolutions. 1914, the war breaks out and all the men scattered to their uh, respective national bourgeoisies, right? <laughs> this is me. Taking the piss a bit, but you know what the point I'm making here. <laughs> One important point is that internationalism was from the very start at the heart of the women's work. If you look at Gleichheit back in 1891, it looks consciously beyond the German borders and, and reports on strikes from everywhere and anywhere in, in, in an active and engaged way. And that internationalism was very real as well. It wasn't just about resolutions, you know. Setkin very consciously reached out 
to working class organizations in Britain in 1913-14 to patiently um, build links with them and convince them of an international of the need for internationalism and anti-war styles. And it leads to international socialist women as early as 1915 organizing a first international meeting of socialists against the war. And this meeting is often uh, most ref referenced because there was a debate there about um, those who had a more pac pacifist stance and the Bolshevik delegation who said like, look, we need to actually look at this war as, as, as the harbinger of, of, of revolution. All the contradictions that are already there will be only massively increased by, by, uh, by, by the First World War. But this meeting was more than that. This meeting organized people to go back into their, into, into their respective cities, organize protests. And on the back of the, of the slogan that was uh, that, that, that they used of war on war, they were able to start organizing the first anti-war protests, using the bread lines to organize working class women. But actually the slogan war on war wasn't some kind of compromise invention in 1915. The first time it's used goes back to 1900 to the Second Boer War. And you can see in Gleichheit that in agitating, uh, ag agitating against those imperialist interventions, that they're all that, 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 that that's where the slogan was rooted in. Yeah. And I mean, the Second Boer War is still a period where a lot of so, so well, a lot of movement people within the movement who probably thought they were socialists. Uh, would have actually had a two-stage theory nearly, right? And wouldn't have had a clear understanding that what imperialism was doing to the world, or would it have seen it nearly as it's bringing capitalism to the rest of the world, and that's a necessary stage to then eventually have a socialist revolution. We actually see in the, the, the writings of Gleichheit and also of, of the Bolshevik women, an understanding of the reality of imperialism, of how it was destroying the planet, and an understanding of, of, of the nature of capitalism. So anyway, my key point is, right, that because of the theoretic, theoretical sharpness of Gleichheit, they were able to bring the socialist women's organization to a correct understanding of the nature of war and why socialists should oppose it. And that's why they were, as a bloc, able to actually withstand the huge pressures at the start of, say, of First World War. And I think it's an important example for us to know about of the importance and the impact of theoretical clarity on real life events on actually being able to build an LTR model. Okay, on to my last point. We're nearly there. <laughs> what the Bolsheviks named uh, agitation of the deed. So there's a general point here, right? About material conditions made the radicalization of working class women in inevitable. And there's actually examples right across the world of working class women uh, struggling in this period, like <laughs> organizing really important struggles. <laughs> there's the example of the match girls, what is known as the match girl strike in London, which was actually the start of new unionism. Mm -hmm. It's traditionally described as this uh, cute little strike of cute little women. Turns out that those cute little women were married and brothers and, uh, and sisters of the, the dock workers who then started what probably one of the most important <laughs> union meetings in, uh, or union movements in, in Britain. There's the example of the East London suffragettes in 1914 who organized um, um, workers uh, mainly uh, women workers, actually, but also organized daycare, cost price restaurants, co ops where women could work uh, at, at decent uh, conditions. There's the example of the Patterson and the Lawrence strikes in the US, where women fought epic battles, textile workers fought ep epic battles around wages and conditions. But one of the first things they organized for themselves was for their kids to be sent away so the kids wouldn't be hanging on, 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 on the mother's legs when they were beaten by the cops. There's 50 people in the room and there's probably at least 10 examples each we could come up with of similar actions that were taken by, uh, by, uh, by working class women. But what, what they all have in common is that they have a very high level of self-organization that included an understanding 
of what, what was needed to assist women workers to become active, to take away the burden of childcare of domestic unpaid labor. The Bolsheviks rec recognized this and they organized along the same lines. They recognized that literacy might be a problem, so they organized literacy classes. They organized childcare for their meetings. They organized meetings at times that suited women and in places that suited women. They had a real flexibility of approach to assist women to become active. And Bolshevik women fought within uh, the Bolshevik party to have the independence to do this and to try different things, to test what would work. And they combined this with a very clear focus on cater development. And this paid off. I mean, the Bolsheviks took these lessons to the third international and to the women's work they did in Russia after 1917. So when after 1917, the discussion started about how to reach out to working and poor women across the Soviet Union, Kolontai, Armand, Krupskaya and, and other Bolshevik women fought for that same independence. And they developed an approach, what they called agitation of the deeds, the idea that you won't win with working class women just with words and, uh, and, 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 and general platitudes, but that you need to demonstrate how practically their lives will improve through the actions you are taking. And make it worth their while. And they set up Zenotel, um, an organization that was meant, yes, to bring women into the, in, into the Bolshevik party, but also to go out across the Soviet Union and explain to women why they should support this, the new state. Um, it was a relatively small organization, but it literally impacted tens of millions of women. They set up a system of delegate meetings in the industrial centers. They set up delegate apprenticeships, which was a combination of literacy classes for women, political education for women, the Sverdlov lectures that you might know from Kolontai are an example of that, combined with the idea that women would take active responsibility in running parts of the state and get experience in, 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 in how to do that, but also bring their own ideas to that. You get women taking part in developing the new housing estates. And all of a sudden those housing estates have a canteen, have a crash at the heart of them, have a school nearby, and just are integrating those points of, of how can women actually become more politically active if those things are in place and there's less of a double burden. Those delegate apprenticeships were from six months to a year. And in the first six years of the revolution, over 3 million women took part in those apprenticeships. And the Notel reached out to sections of the population nobody else could reach. They set, set out with red barges on the Volga. They set up out with red yurts across the, the Caucasus. And if comrades have read the text of the Congresses of the East, there's a small snippet there that gives you a, really insi a real insight into what they were able to do in terms of they actually managed to get at those Congresses, female delegations um, that spoke up in uh, about the women's work that uh, that's not all this. I'm on the plane to come into but all that work was based on encouraging mutual solidarity, uh, practical assistance, as well as political work and integrating all. And this history of 1917 to 1925 has actually been suppressed. It's been written out of working class history. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, we know why, you know, I mean, Stalinism did the exact opposite of all the things I've just described, right? But actually, if you look at the impact of that, of that brief period and the work they did, it's lasting. As late as in the 1930s, you see, for instance, in the Spanish Revolution, mass movements of women, like re mass organizations of women, 20, 30,000 women organizing themselves and referencing back to the experience of the Bolsheviks uh, uh, and, and, and the Russian Revolution. But I think also those features are still there today uh, when working class women move into, in, into struggle. So I think it's really important that we know this history and I think it should inspire our approach.
the comments, I know this was long and stuffy and so on, but I think, you know, the, fo the four points I brought out, I'd love to discuss them further in the discussion. Obviously, people are very welcome to bring more points out <laughs> about why this is so interesting and relevant. Comrades, material conditions impact the building of the Revolutionary Party. Concretely, the stifling heat in this room makes it impossible to fully <laughs> have some of this discussion. <laughs> But um, I had to cut my favorite anecdote about Palantai in my uh, lead off, so I'm going to sneak it into the sum up. <laughs> Various comrades com commented on the breadth of uh, issues that Palantai wrote about. This is somebody who dealt with contentious themes, um, th uh, such as um, alienation, love, sexual liberation. Yeah. And I think we all know some people call themselves socialists who would say that that might turn off sections of the working class. <laughs> this woman was extremely, uh, an extremely good organizer of laundresses, of domestic workers, of the most precarious workers. Here comes my anecdote. In July 1917, in the, you know, the height of, of, of repression, of counter-revolution in, in, in Russia, Kolontai gets lifted from the street and put, be, is put into prison. Uh, the word spreads amongst the domestic workers, amongst the maids. They literally go from house to house saying Kolontai got arrested. <laughs> Within three hours, more than a thousand domestic workers stormed to prison and got Kolontai out. <laughs> it's a nice example of having authority in the working class. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just want to sum up some key points for me that come out of the wealth of examples that were given. Material conditions make it inevitable that working class women are radicalized and take action. But when socialist women consciously intervene into those movements and have an orientation towards women's issues, they can build powerful movements and at the same time play a crucial role in the building of a revolutionary party that truly represents the entire working class. But the history time and again has been that those women have had to fight within the movement for women's issues to be taken serious and a, and a real program to be de developed that it addresses uh, the reality of, of, of working class women's lives. And at the same time had to fight within the movement for working class women to have a voice and to be taken serious. And those who were most successful were those who were ambitious. They didn't just intervene with a view of just building the party in the narrowest sense of the word. They built a socialist wing to that movement that in the most successful cases was able to eclipse the, the bourgeois wing. And because of that success, they were also able to recruit women en masse to, to the revolutionary party. I think actually from this commission, we should consider to go into writing around some of this very rich history. Because when Marx said that the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class, he also meant the ruling history is the history written by the, by the ruling. Commerce, in the past, we often used the cliche of we stand on the shoulders of giants. This afternoon showed that in reality, we stand on the shoulders of unnumbered, nameless working class women. Who, despite extreme exploitation in paid work and unpaid work in the home, had the incredible courage to fight back and organize. And we owe it to them to learn from their struggles, from the methods they used, from the flexibility they showed in the work they developed, in all to, and to take that into all the aspects of our work today. Lofty words to end a very <laughs> warm afternoon, but I think it's concrete. As Ellen said, we have an International Women's Bureau take it serious, engage in the discussions. How, let's have the discussions openly, clearly, and let's, let's make sure that we have the sharpest possible approach we can develop. Yes.